I want to talk a little bit about the Summit on the Future of Undergraduate Geoscience Education that we held uh, in January at the University of Texas. Our goal really was to address questions of importance to the geosciences and to begin to form a collective vision for undergraduate geoscience education. And we had three main topics that we addressed in the summit. The first one was really, what do undergraduates need to know to be successful in graduate school or in the future workforce? Uh, second was, what are the best ways of teaching and using technology for student learning? And third, how can we broaden and increase participation in the geosciences? Obviously, all three questions that are of interest to all of you participating in the webinar. Uh, what I thought I'd do today is tell you a little bit about the organization of the summit and our motivation, uh, talk about our, our outcomes and future plans, and then specifically talk about the roles we see for heads and chairs. Next. So what we tried to do with the summit was get together a very broad spectrum of uh, educators that are involved in undergraduate education. And so we tried to get and did get uh, people from R1 research universities with undergraduate programs, uh, people from four-year, both private and state colleges, as well as people that were teaching in uh, two-year colleges because we felt that unless we got all of us together and talked, rather than talking in our, uh, own, with our own colleagues, we wouldn't be able to address the broad range of issues facing the geosciences. And we also wanted faculty, heads and chairs, as well as people doing research in education to participate. And we had a few industry representatives and professional uh, society uh, representatives attended as well. And so in the end, we ended up about 200 uh, educators and uh, participants at this meeting. Uh, we also wanted to make sure that this was a meeting where people actually talked and discussed issues as opposed to listening to presentations. So we had uh, two keynote presentations. Uh, the meeting was two and a half days. We had one at the beginning of the first two days. And we had three panel discussions to get people thinking about these issues, one for each of the three topics I just mentioned. But the bulk of the time was actually spent in small working group sessions, 10 to 12 people in a working group. And we had a list of questions that they were to discuss relative to each of the topics. And then after several hours, two of the working groups would get together to an intermediate group and discuss. And then each of those intermediate groups would present to the entire group and then we would have a, a discussion afterwards. And it worked extremely well. I should note that all of the uh, summit, except for those individual working group sessions, is recorded and it's available online. The link will always be found at this, uh, what I've listed here is the HTML um, uh, link. But there will be other pages as well. And I should also note that this was really thought to be the first step in developing a high-level community vision. And it's an ongoing community process. And I hope you all will become involved with this. Next. So what were the motivations for uh, holding the summit? Uh, we had motivations for all three of the specific topics. The first one really had to do with geoscience research. It's changed. Uh, and it will continue to change and grow. Our research now is very interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary, and transdisciplinary, which means our students need to not only have strengths in their own disciplines, but they also need to be able to work across discipline boundaries and work with people who don't think like them, do, don't have the same backgrounds. Uh, the uh, research in the geosciences is very definitely uh, become Earth system science oriented. Uh, we recognize that the Earth is a complex system, the different parts of the system, the Earth's interior, surface, hydrosphere, atmosphere, cryosphere, biosphere, they all interact. And what happens in one influences what happens in another. Also that the very processes that we're studying, the chemical, physical, biological, and geological processes are interacting and coupling. And the results that you get when you study them together as opposed to in isolation are quite different. 
So it's really critical for our students not only to think in terms of systems, but they also need to have good grounding in the other sciences so that they can apply those then to uh, geologic uh, processes. Also, obviously still it's important for our students to learn about deep time, but what we see a lot is there's people who study deep time and nothing else, people who study present day processes and nothing else, or are predictive and yet our research encompasses all of those together. And then lastly, in terms of the uh, types of things students should be learning, more and more of the research is addressing societally important issues. So our students really do need to know something about ethics and the economics and policy, and they need to be able to communicate both to scientists and to themselves. And so, as has been shown in other fields and as our uh, a uh, keynote speaker who uh, spearheaded the vision and change document for the biological science, Jim Collins, said, as your research changes, the education has to change as well. But we can't do all of these things for in an undergraduate degree. So the question is, okay, so what do we do if we have all these different uh, areas in which research is ongoing? Next. The second motivation really is in terms of uh, the way we teach. There's been a tremendous transformation in undergraduate education, particularly in STEM. And there are new ways of enhancing student learning, uh, new pedagogies or some old but not used pedagogies uh, for STEM education. There's been a lot of research, discipline-based research, in terms of how students learn. Uh, many of you are... Uh, involved in or your schools are involved in using flipped classrooms or blended learning. Uh, we've got massive online open courses or MOOCs. Uh, you can crowdsource uh, education resources. There's also a great ability to do visualizations and virtual experiences for students and use geospatial tools. And there's also opportunities to share resources and courses uh, amongst the different uh, types of uh, undergraduate education entities and customize things locally. And then there's things that basically go both ways. Uh, we do a lot of computational modeling and simulation, both the processes and global scale events. And our students need to understand these things. And some of them actually need to learn to do these things. The same thing with big data. There's lots of new sensors uh, being developed, and we're getting more and more very, very large data sets. And so knowing how to manipulate these data sets is really important, but also uh, understanding what that data is telling you. And so as with research, as technology and data change, how and what we teach must change. And so that was another motivation for uh, our second topic, in terms of pedagogy and technology. Next. And then the third topic really was, as I said, broadening and increasing participation in the geosciences. And that's really developing an, on a diverse and informed future workforce. And it's not just geoscientists. It's the public at large. We need them informed in terms of the geosciences. And as uh, a lot of the workforce uh, studies by AGI have shown uh, we're predicting up to 12% or more of geoscientists are going to retire in the next 10 years. And there's predicted to be up to a 35% increase in geoscience jobs in the next 10 years. And so we're going to have a dearth of people in the geosciences uh, as professionals, and yet the uh, largest growing demographic is unaware of the geosciences and uh, isn't being exposed to it. Uh, if you look at the um, uh, minorities, uh, first generation, low income uh, students, uh, very much less than 10% of them are in the geosciences and we're at the very bottom of what is uh, for any other science. Uh, also, in terms of looking at the pipeline, only about 10 to 15% of 
students take geosciences either in middle school or high school, and in fact the number of schools that are requiring geosciences has uh, decreased over the last few years. And it's really important for us to uh, prepare uh, students and get them uh, so that they prepare students for being K-12 teachers, uh, both so that they uh, give us an informed citizenry, but also so they instill interest in geoscience careers. And there's been two things that we know have come that have been really, really useful. And that is the next generation science standards has put the geosciences on the same uh, playing field as physical and biological sciences. And then we have the good uh, new geoscience literacy documents. Next. And although there were motivations specifically for each of these three different areas, <coughs> um, there are also external motivations. And what are the motivations for? They're for increasing learning, student learning, to prepare them for the future, not present workforce. And some of this pressure has come nationally from above, Office of Science Technology Policy, PCAS, the President's Advisory uh, Committee, the National Research Council, NSF, all of these organizations have said, this is important, and this is something that you should be doing, and in particular saying that for the geosciences. And you could say, well, why does it matter? And I would say, you know, it's funding, influence, and survival. Uh, funding, if we're doing things that they can see uh, that we're doing what they think is important, uh, there will be more funding to flow. Uh, same with influence, the geosciences has very uh, little influence relative to other sciences at the national level. Uh, if we are addressing these issues uh, in terms of education, uh, we will help with our influence. And then survival, I think many of us remember when geoscience programs were being shuttered across the country and even you know across the world. And if we wish to survive, we need to show that what we're doing is important and it's relevant. Uh, people are getting pressure uh, locally uh, from above. Um, uh, legislatures, coordinating boards, provost presidents, they're all wanting us not only to put students out uh, in the right uh, time frame in terms of graduation rates, but they're also wanting us to prepare the students uh, for future careers. And then, of course, the public and alumni and parents and the students themselves, they want to learn all these wonderful things when they're in college, but they also want to be employable when they get out. And then I would say the last motivation for doing this is really personal. Uh, there's great joy in seeing students really understand uh, concepts that you're teaching. And there's a satisfaction in being a job well done. And of course, it's also your obligation because this is your, your, your job. Uh, next, please. So what were the outcomes? Well, I, w I have to say that it was really, really interesting to just see that although each of these groups were discussing things individually, the outcomes were pretty much the same. Each group had a list of questions they were looking at and discussed them. They all had different backgrounds, different starting points, but things came across as being very, very uh, similar in what people thought. In terms of the first topic, uh, really the major outcome was that we should be focusing on skills, competencies, concepts, and learning outcomes, not disciplinary content or curriculum. The minute you start talking about individual courses, you know, should you teach paleontology or something like that, uh, you won't get any agreement. But when you start talking about what you really want your students to know when they get out and when they graduate, there's tremendous agreement. And the, the key is to be able to embed these skills and competencies and outcomes into your individual curriculum. And things fell into sort of two different categories uh, in terms of skills. It was recognized that there's skills that all scientists need and that our students needed them as well. And you know all these. It's critical thinking, problem solving, being able to communicate effectively, being able to be a scientist, understand and use scientific methods, uh, have strong quantitative skills, and be able to apply those skills and other sciences to 
geologic problems. Uh, being able to work in teams, particularly interdisciplinary teams, and also with people with different backgrounds. And then the ability to access information, integrate information from a wide variety of sources, and also the ability to continue to learn once you're out of school as well. Next. And then there are very specific skills for geoscientists. Uh, it's widely recognized in essentially all of the working groups that we work with uncertainty, non-uniqueness, incompleteness, ambiguity. We use indirect observations and do deductive uh, reasoning. Uh, we need to, our students need to be able to solve problems that uh, involve time, that involve uh, visualization in three dimensions. Uh, we need to, our students need to be able to take observations from the natural world and combine them with experiments and modeling to uh, make interpretations about the Earth system and how these geologic processes or interactions are taking place. Uh, they need strong computational skills and the ability to manage and analyze large data sets. And that comes back to the eye of big data. Uh, this is something that in the future is going to continue to grow is the need to have these computational skills and be able to manage and analyze data sets. Uh, in terms of um, integrating data from different disciplines and applying a systems thinking, uh, that was thought to be important. Also having field skills. It was pretty universal. People thought that strong field skills made a big difference. And also that they needed to be technologically versatile because uh, the world was changing in terms of the technologies that were available. Next. Uh, in terms of concepts, and again, concepts rather than disciplinary content, uh, as I stressed before, the idea that the Earth is a complex system, that there's linkages and coupling both between different parts of the Earth system and processes uh, that affect uh, the Earth. Uh, deep time, including the origin and evolution of life and Earth. Uh, present day processes and the impact of present day processes. Uh, looking at both how present day processes tell us something about deep time, but how deep time tells us something about present day processes and helps us predict things for the future. Uh, understanding how the Earth works, including surficial and tectonic processes natural resources, including water and energy, natural hazards, as well as climate change. All of those were concepts that they felt were important that need to be embedded into the curriculum. And then lastly, understanding the societal relevance of the geoscience topics and to understand the ethical dimensions of those uh, the group thought was important. Next. Uh, in terms of uh, pedagogy and use of technology, uh, it was interesting because the panelists gave us really good background information on what is out there, what people have been doing. And the participants varied from people who were actively creating these things and doing these things to people who really had very little knowledge of any of these. And as a whole, people accepted the fact that there were proven learning methods and proven technology and uses of technology and pedagogy, and that it was really important that we disseminate and encourage the use of these, that we illustrate what the benefits of them are, as well as continue to increase our knowledge base in terms of what works. And along those lines, uh, the thought uh, was that that really focused more on the barriers to and why this had not worked, which I'll talk about in a minute. But in essence, the idea is to incorporate collaborative projects, teamwork, integrative and interdisciplinary work within classes themselves. And so having research projects and experiences both as theses and uh, uh, internships and things of that nature, but also to integrate those into classes and class projects. Uh, we had a number of people who gave examples of different kinds of problem-solving projects that they actually did within the classes. 
and also assault the field experiences were extremely uh, important as well. Uh, in terms of technology, uh, it was felt that uh, things have certainly gone far beyond just eye candy that makes you know things look really good, that there's a lot of tools in terms of uh, visualization and simulation and modeling that can really help students in terms of understanding and exploring and learning to solve issues, uh, that you could have a lot of classroom interactivity by using a lot of these methods. And sometimes these things were appropriate and sometimes they weren't, and that they were something that should be used as much as possible when appropriate. And there was also a lot of discussion that we really needed to use uh, social networking and educational games and crowdsourcing more, that that was something that in the geosciences we hadn't been doing in particular, but that was an avenue and a direction that we should be exploring as well. Next. Uh, as I said, people were really interested and concerned about the barriers and solutions. And you are well aware of most of these. I mean, obviously, resources in terms of financial and space needs. Uh, it takes time to develop and pilot new instructional approaches, and there is support that's needed for it. Uh, space is designed for lecture-based classes instead of interactive classes. Uh, there's a need for technology infrastructure. There's a need for incentives to change. And there's a need for professional development activities to teach people about these different uh, new teaching methods. And of course, the biggest stumbling block, which is difficult to deal with, is the annual performance evaluations and tenure and promotion do not generally reward efforts to improve teaching. Uh, in terms of resources in the community, uh, the feeling was that there needed to be widely available web resources and repository of data and curriculum and examples for effective implementation. But there was also recognition that there was an awful lot of stuff out there, but we needed to build the awareness of faculty of these resources. And then the last barrier, of course, was different incoming student backgrounds and quantitative preparation. Next. In terms of preparation of future uh, K through 12 teachers, uh, it was felt that we really need to integrate the next generation science standards into the undergraduate curriculum, uh, particularly in the courses that are taken by future teachers, because then they would be doing the same when they got out. We need to integrate math and basic science into the course content, not only because our geoscientists need to use these skills, but also because it provides examples that can be used in teaching those subjects uh, in middle school or high school. And then it was agreed that we should encourage collaborations with K through 12 teachers and that through broader impacts and research grants, uh, uh, it would be possible to do this. And it was noted that it really is important to understand what this, the requirements are for teachers in your state and uh, for instruction and what the content assessment is in your local areas. And then lastly, we need to collaborate more between the uh, four-year college faculty and the two-year college faculty. Next. Uh, in terms of broadening participation of underrepresented groups, uh, there was a lot of discussions and examples given of successful recruiting programs. The things that were universal were providing financial support, reaching out to students in their communities, involving members of the community themselves, families, high school teachers, guidance counselors, having role models, and having mentoring. Uh, there was also a lot of discussion of the need for collaboration between four-year and two-year college and uh, Hispanic serving institutions, black uh, colleges and universities and their faculty uh, so that we could have a better pathway to successfully transferring students to four-year colleges. And one example that was given is if you have REUs is uh, recruit and give opportunities to students in uh, these other institutions. A large percentage, sometimes up to 30 percent of the students coming to four-year colleges and universities actually have been to a two-year college already. And it was felt that it was really important to uh, uh, have better coordination. And then, of course, working with uh, other 
STEM programs for minority students um, at the pre-high school and high school levels. And then the real thing is addressing the images of the geosciences. Uh, that's something that by emphasizing the societal relevance and career prospects, we can really increase and, uh, our image in terms of being a career path for people. And uh, we do have an Earth is Calling video and posters and brochures, which uh, anybody who contacts me, we will send as many as anybody wants, and it's not branded. Uh, with UT or any uh, organization or uh, uh, school, so it's easy to use. Next. So one of the questions really is, is how do we sustain change? And there was a bit of a discussion as to whether we have done this before. Last time this was actually uh, attempted was about 17, 18 years ago. And basically, most of the people who are involved there's a lot of people who were involved then, but there's so many new people involved. And since geoscience research has changed, technology and data has changed, and a lot of the culture and motivations are changing, uh, we feel like this is the time to try to do this again. And by learning from the past, really the important thing is to have recommendations that people agree on, so a collective vision. Uh, but then get it embraced and implemented, and that's the hard part. Uh, it will take the effort of all of us, uh, heads, chairs, professional societies, industry, and individual faculty to get this done. Next. So uh, we will be disseminating the results, both this webinar, we're doing town meetings, we'll have articles, talks, uh, reports, and uh, surveys. And we really want to increase the awareness and use of already developed resources and effective pedagogy and techniques. Uh, we need to really further define, this was really the first step, define the vision more, have more granularity, more detailed plans, uh, have examples of where people have uh, embedded uh, the competency, skills, et cetera, into the uh, uh, curriculum. Uh, we will be holding a follow-on activities as well. Uh, and I think role, the heads and chairs have an incredibly important role in stimulating change. Uh, as an administrator myself, I know it's not easy, <laughs> but uh, we really need to establish an academic culture that rewards innovative teaching. Uh, we need to try to improve the instructional infrastructure. We need to give people time and support if they're going to develop and pilot new instructional approaches. Uh, particularly really good teachers find that their uh, teaching evaluations actually go down when they start and then they go up rapidly. That going down is very discouraging and part of that's because they're not comfortable with it yet and the students aren't comfortable with these new approaches. Uh, there need to be performance-based incentives to change. Uh, if your faculty want to go to some of these workshops, like the cutting edge workshops, we need to provide them. Uh, uh, the means to do so. Uh, we should be looking at effective teaching as an important hiring criterion and also teaching our graduate students you know, how to be effective teachers. Next. Uh, professional societies have a major role in disseminating results and spearheading activities. I think if they decide this is important, it will make an enormous difference. Uh, and of course, employers have a major role. They need to give input on our vision and really articulate what the uh, workforce needs are in terms of skills, competencies, and critical concepts. And they need to work with department faculty in helping give us projects and practical applications and research experiences for our undergrads. Next. So for a sustained change in geoscience undergrad education, it's going to take all of our efforts. Uh, it's going to require a cultural change from the administration down to students. And it's, it's a major effort to try to get a community vision that we agree on uh, in these three different areas and actually then overcome the roadblocks to getting it implemented and implementing it. Uh, if you want to view the outcomes, uh, I've given you the link here. Um, you can actually 
go to the summit and you can hear all of the uh, discussions and panelists and keynotes. Uh, we are linking community resources, background reading, and all of our future activities through this site. Next. Also, here is the organizing committee. Uh, you probably know many of them. Uh, if you uh, want to uh, get involved, you can contact me or any of the people on this list. Next. And then uh, just to final, uh, these were our keynote speakers and our panelists. And it was an amazing two and a half days. It was really, really exciting. Next. So thank you. I realize I went a little long. <laughs> thank you, Sharon. Uh, great presentation. And uh, uh, this is Christopher King with AGI, and I'll be moderating the question. Um, as you can see from the directions, uh, if you want to verbally ask Sharon a question, you know, please raise your hand, and we will uh, unmute you. Uh, or if you prefer, you can always just go ahead and type the questions in the, in, in, in the question box, and uh, I will moderate those out to Sharon. So, Sharon, while we're waiting for folks to think through their questions, uh, give, given, you know, from your position, what, what did you see as sort of the, the most surprising outcome from, from the, uh, the summit uh, as far as some of the findings or some of the directions it took? I think the thing that, well, the thing that surprised me the most was how much people agreed. But, uh, I think the most surprising thing was I expected when we poised, poised the question of, you know, what the students need to learn uh, to be successful, that people would start talking about courses. They would be talking about, well, do people nowadays need, you know, mineralogy? Do they need, you know, paleontology? And that they, it, there would be a huge discussion of, okay, what should be in a curriculum? But people didn't go there. I was very definitely people thinking about, okay, what do we need our students to be able to do and to know when they get out. And I thought that was a, a, definitely a surprise. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we have a question coming in. Uh, for goal three as a community, what is the realistic potential for developing an AP uh, Earth Science Geoscience course for high school? And there's a question, is there one? There is not. There is some Earth Science in the Environmental AP. I guess, you know, Sharon, from your reading, what would you take as the potential for that? I, I think we probably would be better off trying to get the environmental AP to be a earth science and environmental AP because there is actually, I've gone through, you know, what is expected for the environmental AP and there's a tremendous amount of geoscience in there. Um, I guess I've seen us try, you know, since the 1990s to get an AP Earth Science, and the argument has always been, well, there's not enough people uh, in the geosciences to make it worth our while financially. Um, we need, as we increase the number of people in the geosciences, that argument tends to go away some. But I, I also think we, our efforts might work better if we tried to just expand the AP uh, environmental science is already there, but I don't know. Okay. We have a question uh, asking about statistics related to uh, 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 people being directly uh, or directly and indirectly employed in geoscience related jobs related to recruiting and uh, Lisa that's something that uh, AGI certainly produces. We will have our status of the geoscience workforce uh, 2014 report will actually hopefully be released in the next couple of weeks. Um, so please be looking for that. That will actually have a lot of that information. Sharon, I don't know, you know, as you interact with industry and in recruiting, are there other sources of uh, data and information you use to, to talk with students about the career opportunities? Wait a minute, repeat that? I'm sorry. I, you know, down at the Jackson School, other than say some of the material that AGI produces, are, are, are there other resources you guys use as when talking with students about career opportunities um, that, that you guys use and leverage or point the students to? Uh, not, not specifically that way. I mean, we, we try to compile, you know, all the, you know, job opportunities there are um, in all the different kinds of fields, and we have a, 
you know, a, a web database that, you know, lists all the different, you know, jobs that are out there that are being advertised. And we sort of s scour <laughs> um, all the websites and stuff to get a fairly robust uh, set. Uh, but we don't, uh, we use the AGI in terms of what the jobs are. Okay. Uh, question, uh, we have lots of questions coming in, which is great. Um, what do you feel, uh, um, what types of efforts do you think would be most supportive, you know, within the geoscience community to find ways to collaborate, you know, with K-12 environment in, in, you know, meeting the next generation of science standards? You know, are there specific things the geoscience community should really be focusing on doing? Well, I think one of the things is uh, making faculty aware of the change in terms of the, the geoscience standards. Uh, it's an amazingly wonderful opportunity for us, the fact that we are now on Earth and Space Sciences on the same playing level as you know, physical sciences and uh, um, biological sciences. And if we can get that embedded into the KC-12 curriculum, it will have an amazing effect on, on our science and on the recruitment of people into our science. And I think it not only getting faculty aware of it, but get them to integrate those ideas and concepts, particularly into the uh, lower level uh, geoscience courses that are taken by all you know, K-12 teachers. Mm -hmm. And I think that was one of the things that there was an awful lot of discussion, which I didn't mention, on introductory courses, what you should have in your introductory course, how it should be you know, taught both to integrate these standards and the literacy documents, but also how it was the best place to recruit and uh, students into the geosciences and what you could do. And there was a lot of discussion focused on the introductory courses as being a real key, both in terms of case utro preparation, bringing in uh, students that would normally come into the sciences, and also then informing you know the public in general. Okay. Uh, one question uh, that came in, Sharon, sort of an interesting angle. Um, what do you see as some ways of uh, in engaging, you know, the employee geoscience community to develop these guidelines or recommendations for what are actually needed to be workforce ready, particular, and, and use that to motivate change in the departments when right now most of the departments are saying, all my students are getting jobs, I don't see a reason to change. Well, if you talk to employers, they will say, yes, all your students are getting jobs and there's no need to change. But they recognize that the workforce is changing so greatly in terms of what students need to be able to do. And uh, so they, I've talked to many, many of them, and we also had people at the summit, and they really feel that a lot of these skills and competencies that came across in uh, the summit themselves are things that they're really looking for. Uh, and it's not so much your students getting hired, but them staying employed, and particularly staying employed when there's a downturn in industry. And uh, so what I'm proposing is that we will actually uh, have and try to get a group of uh, different kinds of employers to look at the outcomes and to give us feedback. And so we've, we've got a preliminary report uh, that's essentially uh, done, uh, try to get input from employers in terms of what they think about the incomes themselves, and also try to work with them. I know certain companies in certain areas work with individual schools in that local area. I think if we can really try to get employers m more willing to you know, interact in a project-oriented way uh, with students in their local areas, it will make a big difference. Mm -hmm. I mean, one of the things that really came across is the days of standing up and giving a lecture and have that be all that you do as a faculty member are really gone. There's been a sea change in the way teaching is happening and we're all getting pressure to move in that direction and yet when you look at the data and the research has been done, 
or when you try it yourself, you find that the outcomes are significantly better than they were the other way around. I mean, there's a place for lecture, but there's also a lot of place for these interactive, project-oriented classes or parts of classes. And so having industry come in and do some of these things with the students or provide the data. Um, we have a few classes where uh, the whole class is a project, and the students are in interdisciplinary teams, and they are given a lot of data and such from industry, and they have to work up the data. And then we actually have industry people come in and uh, uh, judge them um, as if they were, you know, in a contest or uh, in, you know, actually doing something professionally. And we've had it both oil and gas, we've had environmental. I mean, you can get local groups really interested in doing these sorts of things. And the students learn a tremendous amount. And they learn how to learn as well. Okay, that's good. And um, Darren? Another question, uh, interesting. Oh, yes. You there, Heather? Oh, I am. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, if I might add something really quickly to that discussion, um, right now at AGI, in collaboration with the Association of American Geographers, we are conducting a study that is funded by NSF um, to look at the specific skills and competencies um, that are being taught by faculty members and that are being learned by students. Um, in geoscience uh, degree programs, and we're seeing what these master's programs are teaching students and how well they align with what is um, actually needed within the workforce. So we're talking to employers as well to see what are these specific competencies that they're seeking in new hires. And so um, we are currently collecting data. So if any of you out there are interested in this project, in participating in our study, or learning about what types of resources we will be developing uh, coming out of the study, you know, please feel free to drop me a line. Uh, my email address uh, is hrh at agiweb.org, and I can type that out for you. But we are actually looking at this very question, so just thought I'd trip in. <laughs> Thanks, Heather. Uh, so another question, Sharon. Uh, one person is indicating that they're, they're, they're developing a new four-year uh, Earth Environmental Science bachelor's uh, degree program. Is, are there some specific pieces of advice based on what you saw in this summit that they need to take into consideration as they develop that program, looking towards the future? Uh, yes, I think uh, in particular, uh, and there are uh, some examples um, out there, one of the panels uh, you know, there was someone who's doing this um, that gave examples. I think it was David Monk. Uh, but where you look at, you, you define what are the skills and competencies that you really want your students to learn. And then you look at the courses that uh, people have suggested that should be taught, and you try to fit those into uh, the courses and so that you basically scaffold these different skills, you insert them at several places within the curriculum themselves. And think about, you know, I mean, we have a list on there, and the report actually goes into more detail, um, and it's going to be posted soon, in terms of what concepts really are critical. And so if you can get those concepts in there, and you can embed those skills in your curriculum, uh, it should be much more effective. And I know quite a few of the participants actually were came in part because they were in the process of reviewing their curriculum. I know we're doing the same thing. And uh, it really changes the way you think about building a program or changing your program when you think about it in terms of what are those you know concepts, skills, and competencies that you really want your students to know when they get done. I never really quite thought of it that way before, but starting with those things and then looking at you know what the courses should be is a very different way of doing it. Okay. We have a very, very interesting but complex question from Larry uh, um, Moody. Uh, Larry, I'm going to unmute you. I don't know if I could actually uh, provide the uh, uh, same level of uh, clarity on your question. So Larry, uh, I've unmuted you. Okay, I'm here. Are you hearing me? 
Yes. Yes. Okay. So my concern was um, really based around all of this question of resourcing and providing appropriate rewards for innovation and recognition that uh, when instructors attempt to flip classrooms or get more student-driven learning, uh, evaluations typically, at least initially, drop. Um, all, of, all of that has to be uh, accepted and understood in the context of, of an evaluative system that really isn't housed within the geology department or the ge earth science program, uh, at least at most four-year colleges. All of these decisions are being made at a, at a larger administrative level and by people who have no particular appreciation for geoscience and who probably already come in with preconceptions that geoscience may be the lesser of the sciences. And by gum, our chemists need these S10 resources. Um, why should we give them to, or why should we cut some special slack to the geoscientists? And I'm wondering if uh, there was any thought given to how we, uh, how we persuade uh, folks that are not familiar with how multidisciplinary and interdisciplinary and integrative geology has always been and still is, how do we persuade them that we are um, more deserving of the obviously always very limited resources? I guess I would answer it in, in a couple ways. One, a lot of the things that need to be done aren't just for the geoscientists. It's for all you know, science uh, and engineering fields. And in some cases, it's for all, uh, you know, all areas in terms of having the technology infrastructure and the, the uh, culture where trying to improve your teaching and trying to method actually, teaching methods actually counts for something. That's something that's somewhat universal across four-year colleges or uh, universities in yes, terms of sure. everybody needs that. So if you can get if you can get the your colleagues in other colleges or other departments to basically come together and go to the administration saying we need this across the board. It's not that we're special as geoscientists, we need this. We all need this. And that you right. will improve the the yeah. outcomes of everybody if, if you do this. I think we're. I think most departments and most faculty are on board with all of that. But at most institutions, the pie is pretty much fixed. You know, we've been operating with flat budgets in our department for uh, quite some number of years, as have most of the other departments. We are inevitably in competition uh, for some of these resources, mm -hmm. or for release time, or for um, well professional development opportunities. Somehow we have to, we have to uh, be able to establish ourselves competitively as well as co collaboratively. Right, and I, I do understand that. I guess what I was trying to say, a, a number of these things are, everybody has the same issue, particularly, for example, in terms of promotion and tenure and such, and trying to get the administration, and we actually tried to get as many high-level administrators as we could at this as well. Um, but So that's one thing. Uh, the other thing in terms of, for example, professional development makes a huge difference. The uh, faculty I've had that have gone to the, and grad students to the cutting edge workshops have just really found them incredibly valuable. And that's one role I think professional societies could have. I know certainly in physics, the physics, American Physical Society has done things, you know, our geoscience societies, if they decided that this was important, they could, I mean, they a lot of them fund you know, research grants for students and things like that. I mean, they could actually work to try to help provide the professional development type uh, experiences at their meetings and um, perhaps even have grants for you know, people to go places and stuff. So you know, there obviously isn't an easy answer. Um, uh, but I think it's very definitely something that we, as an administrators, really, or chairs and heads, we really need to try to change things. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> That's all I've got. 
<laughs> thank, thank you, Larry. I guess um, the other thing might be is if we could get uh, employers to create pressure on the administration, it might help. Okay, so Sharon, another uh, got a couple more questions here before our two o'clock uh, time limit. Uh, discussion about some departments are, you know, many many departments are reporting all their students are getting jobs, but there's other departments we see this at AGI that are saying, hmm, <laughs> no one, you know, my students aren't finding uh, employment opportunities. Um, and this is a plug for those that are looking at it. It's one of the reasons we're AGI is doing our National Geoscience Student Exit Survey because we hear lots of anecdotes. We're trying to actually measure it. But Sharon, from your perspective, from what you heard at the summit, uh, do you have a sense for why we sort of get a everyone gets employed or the the, the students are real, the graduates are, are really challenged to find employment? It, from what I heard, both at the summer and I hear otherwise uh, in other contexts. A lot of it is actually what the students know how to do. Uh, I hear a lot, and we heard a lot uh, at the summit, or at least I did, about the need for students to have really strong basic science skills, you know, chemistry, physics, uh, math, computational abilities. Uh, and that makes a big difference when people are looking at students uh, it, to employ. It's, you know, how strong is their science background. Uh, and also, soft skills, <laughs> being able to talk, being able to communicate, being able to write, being able to, uh, you know, think on their feet. Um, things like that really make a huge difference when students are being interviewed. Uh, and so, you know, it's a combination of, they look at somebody's you know, transcript and they see what courses they taught and they don't a lot of times even know what those courses are. They have names that they don't understand. Uh, now that really should be education of the employer as opposed to changing the names of your courses. But I think those are some of the reasons that uh, in some schools students are being uh, you know, given the opportunity to work in teams. They have really strong science standards. Uh, they learn to communicate and write and uh, things of that nature. In other schools, that's not stressed very much. Mm -hmm. Okay. And the person asking the question is also stressing in their specific region. Uh, their job market is a bit different, and and they're uh, really struggling with those in industry educator collaborations, which I think you know, again, it, it's the communication mechanisms are, are a challenge there. Yes, I would um, agree. So a couple last questions here, uh, Sharon, for you. Um, the person indicates that uh, they're getting some pressure and expressions of concern from their colleagues in their geography department who feel that the geoscience department is encroaching uh, on their territory. Uh, and they're wondering, you know, how do you, how do you manage that political intrigue and, and, uh, and conflict in a, a university environment? It, well, a part of it depends um, on what the motivation is for the concern. If it's concern that they're taking students away from them or uh, um, resources away from them, it's a little different. I mean, really, in terms of uh, educating the other department in terms of what kinds of uh, skills that your students need in the geosciences that you know go into the geospatial or um, GIS and those sorts of areas. I'm assuming that's where the encroaching is taking place, um, and you know, showing that their students, if they took courses in your department, would learn things that would be helpful for them, and vice versa. Um, really trying to get them to collaborate is probably the best way. But there's always a lot of it could just be lack of understanding that. You know, geoscientists absolutely have to understand these things, and they have to use these things uh, in their, you know, research in their uh, uh, future jobs, things like that. Okay. And uh, our very last question, Sharon, uh, since it's two o'clock, um, can you talk about uh, 
during the summit and your experiences, uh, thoughts of recruiting students who are already on campus into the geosciences. This one person's pointing out that uh, they don't usually see any of their majors until they're in at least their sophomore year. Um, and how, how can they, you know, any, any strategies for recruiting earlier more successfully? Um, I guess I would say uh, a couple things. I mean, depending on where you are, a lot of uh, a lot of universities or colleges have um, uh, days where you can set up at orientation and various times you can set up tables, you can uh, you know, have information about your college, you can talk to people about your college. Uh, getting your faculty to go into uh, high schools or even your alums into high schools around the area and talk about the geosciences and what can be done and in that case we have this uh, video, short four minute video that's uh, really good and we have a brochure for volunteers and we have posters that can be handed out and we again we do send anything to anybody they need for free. Um, but really trying to generate interest at the high school level in the geosciences would really help. Um, but also around, I mean, you know, going a lot of schools have you know, career days or they have, uh, when students first come onto campus, about clubs and various things and you know, just trying to get the word out. Okay. 